friends how are we doing today can i get a round of happy emojis if you're with us yeah 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 we got one corner we got the whole spread perfect welcome to this fabulous day saturday october 3rd uh my name is aiden i am your project manager here with pxr the performance and xr symposium 2020 uh, I am speaking to you here from the stolen and unceded territories in East Vancouver with the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Uh, just like to take a moment to thank our beautiful Canada Council Digital Art Strategy Fund for helping us pivot what would have been an in-person conference into a full VR experience to talk about what we can do with digital technology nowadays. Beaming in from Toronto, I would like to introduce Nick Fox Gig, who has created this wonderful lightning toolkit. And to speak more about it, the creator. All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, this is my first time presenting in VR and feel reasonably articulated. So I'm going to talk about the lightning artist toolkit, which I've been working on for the past four years or so um, as a way to draw in VR and then use what I make in animated short films. And, you know, I've been amazed by Six Stuff controllers since they came out. Uh, the idea of being able to create in 3D as expressively and intuity, intuitively as in 2D has always been just amazing to me. So my background is in traditional animation. So drawing frame by frame in Flash. And being able to bring that stuff into Blender Grease Pencil uh, specifically has been kind of the taking off point for uh, all of the you know short film work that I hope to make. In um, has the host has called on you and made you louder. Okay, cool, good. Can everyone hear me? So um, the uh, the ability to actually uh, create in all sorts of um, using all sorts of different platforms, not being locked into one, bringing all that stuff into Blender Grease Pencil and you know, make a short film just like I used to in Flash was just incredibly compelling. So um, this is one of my later experiments here. I am using this in a uh, Mirage with the mixed reality mode turned on. And uh, you know, here I am moving around the space where I am right now and doing a little sixed off drawing. Now, as far as I know, actually, um, the Mir Mirage, what I gather is pretty much canceled, is the, um, one of the only headsets where you can actually do this pass through uh, while also holding two controllers. The Focus might be able to do it. I mean, the Quest might be coming out with that at some point. Um, point is, um, being able to work independently of any one hardware platform or application. So it's a bunch of open source tools um, for Blender, for Unity, and for 3.js. And so what I can do uh, is take you know, frame by frame drawing, which is in a file format that I created, and move it between any platform I want. Um, and we're going to uh, pop into a world at the end of this presentation and see uh, some animation that I've created and was able to bring into Altspace. Um, so here is even, uh, even earlier, I started off working with the Hydra, if anyone remembers that, the, um, the Razor Hydra early, uh, just before the Vive. Um, and um, Leap Motion Controllers, which uh, used to have a stylus mode. Um, so all of this passes into Unity, and it can uh, all be um, you know, rendered however you like. Uh, in this case, just with the basic Unity line renderer. And uh, as we got into Tango and uh, AR Kit and AR Core enabled phones. I was able to um, bring some of my experiments over to uh, those. So here we are drawing frame by frame over live 
video footage using the same framework. And um, here is a group of experiments. I've been sort of posting these on Instagram for the past couple of years. Um, not limited to that Unity line render, but because you have all of the stroke data preserved, you're not just dealing with a sort of a, a mesh and you're done. Uh, you can take all of this information and render it however you like. You can mesh it in a number of different ways. You can bring it into a number of different platforms. Um, Unreal uh, brought is uh, brought in there. QJS, Hololens, Magic Leap, just trying to uh, find a way to a um, sort of perfectly portable and universal drawing toolkit. So this is uh, the process. So here I am drawing a tilt brush. Uh, tilt brush has a completely open file format, so could, tilt brush can't do frame by frame animation, but it does have a, a completely open file format. So I'm able to integrate that into my toolkit. So it reads tilt, tilt brush files at the stroke level. So here I've brought that into Blender. And I'm able to animate frame by frame in Blender Grease Pencil and then render out the result. Um, more recent, this is Blender 2.79. More recent versions of Blender uh, actually uh, add the ability to view real time in VR in Blender itself, which I find really interesting. Um, and, um, and also uh, render real time with Blender EV. But the really interesting thing that I'm heading into now, and I've actually just started a PhD at uh, York University, um, working with machine learning and volumetric drawing. Because, because I can access all of the data, all the stroke data myself, um, I'm working on a way to convert volumetric video into brush strokes and work with it um, like I would composite um, traditional flat video and 2D drawing. Because my animation, <coughs> excuse me, my animation practice um, has always been uh, heavily based on collage and compositing. And the idea of bringing all of that into 3D. So here I am working in a Vive, um, actually having brought in just contour based volumetric video. And here I am painting it. And here are some renderings out of Blender. So it's still a little crude, but I really am looking forward to being able to work, um, again, like exactly like I do in 2D, but in 3D. And here is a 3JS thing. This is live on my website now. Um, I hooked this up to Magenta to play notes. Here is a machine learning model of my own piano playing from high school. So it is using the um, points in the stroke data to generate random music. <laughs> Again, this is only possible because I've got all of the uh, stroke data accessible. I'm not just you know making a flat mesh. I've got all of the brush stroke information. So it's sort of become a platform for all sorts of things, um, all sorts of interesting research besides uh, short film production, which was my kind of original idea.
And where I'm trying to go with this now is to be able to record uh, an RGBD video. Um, so I'm really interested in um, depth capture um, strategies that I can feed through um, the analysis tool I'm sort of working on to generate uh, brush strokes. So um, I have prepared a little world there to uh, sort of demonstrate the flexibility of this. So Altspace doesn't natively support any sort of frame by frame format that I'm aware of, like Alembic, for instance. We tried when I was working with Alex and Aiden to get some of the stuff in there for this presentation. Um, like it won't let you uh, import Alembic files, for instance, um, or you know volumetric video from movie clips. But we were able to um, figure out how to generate with my toolkit um, some frame by frame animation that we can go see. So before we head into the portal, um, and we have actually tested this just now for uh, Quest people as well, which is awesome. I'm on a Vive. Um, before we head into the portal, um, just any Q and A. Uh, also, my um, little uh, amplify voice does not work in the other world. Uh, someone has raised a hand. Raise hand. Hi. Um, so we can, you know, it won't be as easy to hear. So yeah, any questions about this? Yeah? Yes. You are on the air. Hi. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, yeah. um, since you're just uh, testing out this animation to be uh, seen via the quest here, if uh, your program is usable with the quest. Yep. Um, so in the end, it is uh, just a um, Unity package. And yes, I, it, it does work on the quest, and I have tested it in there. Awesome. Any, any other, other questions? Any other questions? No? You, all right. All right, well, shall we all head in then? Further questions can be asked in the space. All right, let us head over to, will we still be on air in the, in the world? So in, in the new world, we are not gonna have megaphone capabilities. So right. if we can all huddle around, don't worry, social distancing doesn't count in VR, we'll be safe. <laughs> And if you'd just like to head up the stairs into our Lightning Artist Gallery, we will meet you in the next world. Okay, so um, this is the um, basic trick of this. I've managed to mesh one of these drawings and then I'm actually just uh, using scale keyframes to um, show and hide each frame of the animation in turn. And I'm using a vertex shader to, um, to handle the colors the same as you would for tilt brush or for quill. Do uh, any folks here, do you do um, VR drawing or um, <laughs> no. I just started using Tilt Brush. Cool. Um, I'm only a week into my yeah. VR headset. <laughs> nice. Yeah, um, that is one of the best ways to um, actually use this. Um, the um, the Tilt Brush files are actually prepared. Um, are actually able to be imported uh, directly into uh, Blender with
with this. Uh, cool. That's awesome. Can some some of that uh, program again? I didn't catch it. Mm. Uh, so it is. Uh, so Blender is the Blender Grease Pencil is where I've actually created all this animation, and um, I call my uh, plugin the Lightning Artist Toolkit um, that I use to um, convert as many different kinds of drawing as I uh, can get a hold of. Into um, into uh, into Blender Grease Pencil, where all this stuff actually gets created. Um, another thing is that this allows me to do point cloud editing. Um, this is a really interesting aspect of uh, Blender Grease Pencil works with points as well. So I'm able to erase, draw on, recolor point clouds. Um, so I really am hoping that this ends up being a frame by frame animation uh, situation. Um, that goes beyond just uh, working with uh, hand-drawn cartoons, which I'm you know, primarily interested in, but also incorporating any live-action footage uh, into, uh, into a drawn environment. Um, this sort of um, hack is going to be um, just uh, temporary, I mean, because it, it, uh, this is already uh, seven megabytes, I believe, and the limit on the worlds that uh, Alex said was um, uh, 25. So we are already uh, winging it. Th this world, this gallery is going to be up throughout the um, festival, and I, I'll add a few more pieces to it um, as I convert them. But the um, the well, we, we quickly r run up against the um, uh, size limits. So uh, one thing, I'm, I'm very curious if anyone's working with volumetric video, or volumetric drawing, uh, any ideas about formats and how to get essentially more space. Um, super interested in talking. I'm actually talking to some of the folks at the MPEG group. They're actually working on a volumetric video format that they, uh, them and Kronos, they want to push to the standard, um, which would let us basically get a lot more because um, you can compress a mesh the same as you can compress an image. Uh, get a lot more. Um, I think and for, also uh, at, hmm? yeah. I think for alt space, um, the public spaces are more limited in size mm -hmm. um, and and bandwidth in general. But um, like they control that on their servers. You might actually because in, you're developing something they probably be very interested in, if they haven't already yeah. contacted you, uh, be able to access la larger spaces. Um, Interesting. Okay. Because um, I have friends, I made some friends on here who have been here for quite a while, um, mm -hmm. and the common space campground, um, there, um, that's like on a larger, better quality server because it's it's an invitation for like everyone. So that it has to be able to capacitate or have the capacity for a lot of people. So when we were testing stuff out, they're like, "Oh yeah, this is not as uh, laggy or whatever, no matter what you do, because it's like one of their prioritized servers." So you might be able to speak with them to develop in a, a space with um, a bit more uh, priority service. That is really cool. Okay, thanks so much. They also do, yeah. um, I think it's monthly meetings with the owners or whatever, the the main creator. Right. Yeah. Neat. Yeah, I mean, like, all this stuff, bandwidth is going to be a huge, um, yeah, it's such a, a huge problem. Even getting this ready for Quest folks was a very last-minute affair. Like, uh, they didn't have documentation uh, on their site. They only had desktop, how to prepare the world. So we winged it and we got it working, which is great, which is why um, probably a lot of you can't even be here. Um, but yeah, it is uh, such an interesting challenge to um, to get this working for everybody. Any other questions? Got some... Uh, 
thoughts. Um, is anybody working with machine learning and uh, point cloud based solutions or, or 3D graphics in general? So I see a ding, people. Um, what was that? <laughs> did, did, everyone else, did anyone else hear that? I feel like I'm. Uh, um, if you're hearing things that we're not, yeah. Right. I'm wondering if that's my time. I think that might actually be my um, oh. my notice that we're 15 minutes from the hour. Okay. Cool. Uh, so thanks so much for coming. And uh, yeah, hope to see you guys around the uh, conference. And any more um, questions are going to be on the Discord. Yeah. Just so everyone knows. Um... Thank you so much, Nick. That was, I'm right behind you. I'm gonna yell out like, yeah. <laughs> thanks so much for, for coming, for speaking. Um, it is 1244 right now. Our next presentations won't be starting until 115. So you have a half an hour. Feel free to hang out in this space. There will be a portal created that you can access this space for the rest of the week. Uh, there are also other surprise portals that are popping up in PXR Central. But I also encourage you to go hop around, enjoy some worlds across alt space, see if you can start building something in your own custom world, utilizing some of these tools. Otherwise, we can meet most of you back in presentation room A for Renaissance presentation of their VR opera, the next generation of opera. Thanks so much, folks, and go have a good time.
I know you're going to be stopping people from filming in during the show, um, but uh, you could also move this on point so you're not in the middle where people I know. Go I, I know. Yeah. So it's it's interesting because I'm using an alt space template. Um, yes. It doesn't, and, and it's an event. It doesn't let me change spawn point. Whereas in world, uh, you can change. I know. In in our when we were doing tests with it, I had the spawn point be right over here. Yes. It's very unfortunate. <laughs> oh man, yeah. Yeah, I haven't hosted any events yet. I just sort of <laughs> came out of one thing. So yeah. Did you okay. see the uh, the portal to your world that I added to the PSO Discord? No, I haven't. Welcome, everyone. Can I get a round of applause? Some uh, smiley applause. Yay. Awesome. So uh, PXR would like to begin by acknowledging the support of the Canada Council for the Arts Digital Strategy Fund in helping us uh, get this whole event organized. We acknowledge that uh, this event has been primarily organized on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, uh, the Salatooth, Musqueam uh, 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 nations. And, uh, and now I would like to introduce to you our uh, presenters check, check, for today. Check, check. Uh, oh, they're doing some checking. Great, nice. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> these, this is probably one of the most ambitious uh, projects I've ever seen, and they're way ahead of the game in terms of what they're doing. I also find their presentation very ambitious. So uh, uh, they have they have really uh, set themselves a high task, and uh, it just shows that they are, are the folks who like to shoot for the stars. So uh, I present to you, uh, this is Debbie Wong, Conrad Sly, Yuhan, Yuhan Guan, Neil Nair, and Brian Toff of Renaissance Offer Company, here to tell us about uh, Orpheus VR. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much, Alex, and thank you everyone at the PXR Festival that has been helping us put this together. Uh, this is no small feat, and you have all done an incredible, mind-blowing job. Thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is Debbie Wong, and I am the creative director of Orpheus VR, a choose-your-own adventure opera that immerses audiences in the mythological world of Orpheus and Eurydice. I'm very happy to be joined with my core creative team. They're to my right over here. Um, they are Yuhan Guan. Yuhan, can you wave or emoji? <laughs> That's our developer and our interactive director. Uh, Brian Topp, our composer and interactive audio director. Um, Conrad Sly, our 3D artist and art director. Thanks, Conrad. And Neil Nair, our animator. Orpheus VR is currently in development for Oculus Quest. And today we're going to tell you a bit about our process and the tools we've used to translate a historical art form and a kind of wild idea into a high fidelity prototype. 450 years ago, in Florence, an interdisciplinary group of philosophers, poets, singer songwriters, artists, and performers started gathering regularly to bemoan the current state of the arts and ideate on how they might reclaim dramatic texts and bring them to life in a way that would immerse their audiences and affect their emotions. They looked to reclaim the practices of ancient Greek theater. They dissected the art of rhetoric and they wondered what kind of role music played in Greek theater and if the culmination of music, poetry, and rhetoric might not be the key to recreating the powerful storytelling experiences they were seeking out. With these foundations in mind, a new dramatic style was born, one that embodied the rhetoric of Greek drama, 
but had music underlying all of the theatrical act, uh, action and text resulting in the birth of what we now know to be Western opera. This was all very much in line with the humanist movement at the time, which was at its peak in Europe in the 16th century and sought out a revival of classic Greek and Roman culture. I'm going to play an excerpt for you now of the one of the first and most popular operas to be created called Orpheus. Uh, so the original story of Orpheus, um, as was presented in the operas and is often told as a myth, uh, is, is centered around this musician whose voice is so sweet that even the gods of the underworld let him pass through the realm of the dead unscathed to the, reclaim the soul of his dead wife, Eurydice. I like to tell the story of the birth of opera and introduce its roots because it was very much a process of ideating, innovating, and prototyping, all in the name of reconnecting with powerful modes of immersive storytelling. And even though the intent was to reclaim historical art forms, the process of doing so laid a foundation for something unprecedented and entirely new to emerge. So two years ago, another group of artists sat around at a local bar on Commercial Drive in Vancouver, BC, not necessarily bemoaning the state of the arts, but certainly questioning what kind of artistic experiences might be possible given the boom in access to emerging technologies. Orpheus VR was born out of that conversation and a series of questions. What would opera look and feel like if it were invented today? What is essential to what we understand as Western opera, and how can technology innovate the audience experience of those essentials? And what can historical opera offer to teach emerging technologies and art artistic forms? So to answer the first question, I will now play you a small excerpt of our version of Orpheus. So what you saw there is our design of Orpheus singing something similar that you saw to the first excerpt, which is Orpheus singing to their lover Eurydice. The second question, there we go. Um, the second question is uh, what is essential to our understanding of opera and how can technology innovate the audience experiences of those essentials? And there were two main aspects of opera that we really wanted to explore within the framework of VR storytelling. The first is what you saw showcased in the video clip, which are the unique ways that opera singers bring their characters to life, both physically and vocally, which led to the use of motion capture to preserve the physical and facial expressions of our performers, which Neil will tell you about later when he speaks to animation. The second aspect to opera that we wanted to expand on is the use of music and sound. Because opera is a musically driven narrative form, that means that the text and the music are inextricably bound and equally responsible for depicting narrative and moving it forward. This presented all kinds of opportunities in a 360 story world, which, which when we are creating one, we have to think about 
how the entire world sounds and how the users move through the world and how it sounds as they're moving through it. But in opera, what that actually translates to is kind of like an orchestral score. So when a mo user moves into portion A as opposed to portion B, what does that sound like? And how does that all come together to form a cohesive narrative? Both Yuhan Guan and Brian Top will speak to those things a little bit more. Um, but it also introduced the idea of interactive audio to us. Um, as users are moving through our environment, there's things that they can interact with. And instead of them sounding like they normally would in the real world, we thought, what if it could change the orchestration and allow users to co-create their very own operatic experience with us by playing through the narrative? Lastly, we wanted to showcase what historical opera can offer emergent narrative forms. And again, this is where the music comes in. It's a powerful narrative force. It can draw our attention, it can drive our attention, and it can impact our emotional responses. And the user testing for these ideas has been happening for hundreds of years. So in Orpheus VR, we are essentially exploring how these tried and true musical narrative devices can help overcome the challenges unique to VR storytelling. I'm gonna turn the presentation over now to our developer, Yuhan Guan, who will tell you more about how we designed our narrative and how we've dealt with storytelling challenges in VR. Okay, hi, uh, I'm Yuhan. It's such a pleasure to be here to talk about Im implementation of Orpheus VR so far. Um, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so first of all, I want to talk about why we choose VR. Virtual reality applications are perfect medium to Im uh, provide fully immersion to the audience. Unlike the traditional theater setup for operas, where the opera usually happen on stage in front of all the audience, the audience could be surrounded by the environment and the characters in VR, where they can be in the center of the opera and even be a part of it. So we choose Oculus Quest as our target device, which is fully standalone and cordless. And uh, this also provides us the opportunity to provide interactivity to the user using the touch controllers. We want, because we want the audience to be a part of the opera, interactivity came, came into a key element in our branch storytelling. So at the early stage of our designing uh, the experience, we choose to use branch storytelling techniques to design our story. So in this case, user could feel more engaged and they will feel their own influence to the path of the characters and their action actually inf uh, change the path of the storyline. So to implement all these interactions and uh, uh, branch storytelling logistics, we use Unity Engine as our main development pl platform. So because we're developing for Oculus Quest, we're using the Oculus on software development kit to handle the tracking and the user input, but we customize it to our own version to fit our own visual and functionality need. We developed a few event system and uh, uh, action managers to hook the user's input with our sound and animation where uh, Neil developed using the timeline and uh, Brian developed using the wise sound integration in Unity. Next slide, please. So there are a few challenges we encountered during our design and development process. First of all, is to direct users' attention in a physical environment, which is a very tricky and common challenge in nowadays 360 content no matter it's film or interactive experiences. Because the user have ability to look around in your environment, which could be very, very big or even infinite, look like infinite, um, we need to make sure the user don't miss too much of our own storyline. They could miss a small part for example, a visual expression of the character or even miss like a major interaction between multiple characters. So we, we went through quite a lot, great uh, physics experiences and films to learn a few tricks. For example, we could use 
they could narrow down the visible environment when major events happening and using highlighting to get users attention. And they also use spatial sound and visual cues to, to attract users attention. They also plan the intensity of the storyline a little bit with a uh, peak moment and relax moment. They make sure to provide the, uh, the audience some exploration stage with fun little details in the environment so that they could let their own attention to, to enjoy the environment and then lead them to a few minutes of intense storytelling events. Uh, next slide, please. Also, teaching user how to interact uh, with the objects in the experience naturally is very difficult without breaking the immersion. They chose not to use any text or user interface guidance. They choose, instead, they choose to use voice guidance and uh, animation trigger for user uh, to guide user what they can do and when they should move or interact with certain objects. For example, we use voice guidance to tell user to follow Orpheus, where Orpheus then emerge and walk along so that user will then know to follow the character. Next slide, please. Another thing we try to ensure the immersion is to use enough of uh, feedback. For example, we, we choose to use haptic feedback, which is majorly the vibration on the controller to simulate the touch of the object. Since their virtual hand is mapping with their physical hand one-to-one, we -one, want the interaction to be natural as possible. And however, because all the virtual object actually doesn't exist, so we try to utilize the haptic feedback, luckily we have with the controllers, as much as possible. Also, we try to use visual and audio feedback, like dynamic sound triggered by the actions of the user to ensure that the user know their, their action actually matters to the experience. There, Brian will talk more later in his section. So now I will hand over my presentation to Conrad to talk more about art and design of the story. Thank you. All right, can you guys hear me? All right, okay, great. So when Debbie and I initially started talking about wanting to try to make a VR opera experience, we wanted to explore using VR tools to do so, uh, such as Quill and Medium. Uh, here you can see an early sketch I did in uh, Quill, uh, which is a VR painting tool. So after doing a bunch of research into these tools, I thought that the painterly style in Quill could work and perform well on the Oculus Quest. Um, prior to doing this, my background was in photorealistic architectural visualization, uh, which we knew we were not really going to be able to achieve on the Quest. So we began you know, exploring more art styles seen in games. Uh, after a few weeks of messing around doing some tests with this, the features of Quill, uh, we had a nice opportunity to show early development at an opera event in Toronto. Uh, the idea we came up with um, was to showcase some of the storyboards that I painted in VR. I painted a landscape set and a couple of characters, Orpheus and Eurydice. This was then translated into a musical 360-degree fly-through VR experience for the Oculus Go at the time. And uh, the attendees of the opera event could get an early glimpse of our intentions uh, for this project. We also experimented with having an opera singer inhabit one of these virtual environments during a live performance. And the audience could see uh, what she saw on a big projection behind her. This was really great fun, and it was really fun to experiment a lot with these ideas, but ultimately it was tangential to our goal of translating the opera to a VR experience. After this stage, we were exper experimenting a lot with ideas of what the next steps were going to be. We ran through a basic pipeline of blocking in the environment to scale, uh, doing a sketch over, and then creating assets in Quill to match the ideas in the sketch. What I discovered about the tool like Quill at this time is that it creates topology or polygons kind of on the fly, uh, like in your brushstroke. And, and these can get quite heavy. 
especially for mobile devices that are limited in the amount of polygons they can support. So after doing a bunch of tests with these kind of assets, it became pretty clear that they're not really production quality for our goals um, and the platforms we had in mind. Or, you know, they would just require like too much cleanup. So like it was really fun to use it for concept, but uh, we, we ultimately decided that we needed to, you know, find a, a new pipeline. One of the other issues with creating was that we like, we didn't really have uh, a strategy for creating a production ready character asset for motion capture with these tools. Uh, so the technology just isn't quite there yet in that regard. So then we had to move on to figuring out what our strategy for doing the motion capture is going to be. And after some research into many different kinds of software and hardware in that regard, one of the connections that I had from the center of digital media where I did my master's degree in Vancouver was the wonderful people working out of the sawmill motion capture studio here in Vancouver. We chatted with them a bunch and we settled on using Real Illusion's iClone character creator tools to create the characters and rigs to do real time performance capture. And it was a great mutual benefit for both of our uh, teams because we both wanted to try this pretty new and relatively affordable motion capture solution. So we first had to design the Real Illusion story of the character, which I was tackling drew a lot of inspiration from myths and, and myth games, and uh, we wanted to put our own spin on it. So for Eurydice, she's typically a damsel in distress, and we wanted to empower her role in our branching storyline, making her a strong-willed dragon. For Orpheus, we stylized him to be a songbird with features that emphasize his musical and whimsical nature. Ah, next slide, please. So we, uh, for Orpheus, um, because we didn't want to use any props, uh, uh, to, which we, we thought would like overcomplicate the motion capture uh, production, uh, we incorporated elements of his musical instrument into his clothing. Uh, as you can see, the strings of his lyre. Um, it, and, you know, somewhere along the way, it became pretty clear that, you know, with my background not really being in character design, it'd be awesome to have some help uh, to create a production quality concept of the character. So we hired uh, Dorothy Yang, uh, an Amer uh, amazing character designer here in Vancouver, to help uh, bring our characters to a higher standard. Then it was my job to start using the, the 3D tools, uh, the character creator and ZBrush to design the characters in 3D. The pipeline is really wonderful, and the, oh, sorry, hold on, I'm having a problem here. Um, yeah, the pipeline is really great. Uh, character creators presets, uh, you can customize your character a lot, but then like send it to ZBrush to do some sculpting and modify it, but then quickly send it back to character creator, and you uh, retain a completely functional rig for the face and body. And this was honestly like really game changing for us because, you know, we don't really, I didn't have any experience rigging a character before. So to have one of reasonably high quality um, at this stage was like really awesome. Um, but, you know, things don't always quite go to plan. As you can see here, uh, this is uh, Brophius, as you can see. We may have lost Conrad. <laughs> um, Ryan, can you clap if you can still hear Conrad? Did we lose Conrad? No, I can't hear him. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Was I, was I, did it mute me? Yeah. I think you got yeah, muted. Um, but we're here. <laughs> okay, we're here? Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, if you guys have any questions about any of that stuff, uh, I'll be happy to answer questions later. Sorry about the technical problem there. Um, for the environment, we started out sourcing some assets from the uh, Unity Asset Store uh, to quickly prototype um, interactions and motion capture sequences. Uh, like it, it, it just saves a bunch of time to like get get something going really early on. 
Um, we have started designing our own assets for the project, which is still like very much a work in progress. But uh, somewhere along the way, Debbie had written this wonderful backstory for the characters and creatures um, in the story, including the forces and gods and fates behind the scenes pulling the strings. Um, here, for example, we have uh, the forces of the fates uh, being chaos, uh, the weaver, prophecy, and destruction. And these are all the prime movers of the events leading up to Orpheus and Eurydice's story. Uh, we wanted to tell the backstory through world building and environmental storytelling in fun ways and subtle interactions, uh, translating the ideas of the backstory to architecture and illustrations in the world for the players to discover. Once again, we relied on Dorothy to help us realize some of these visions, characterizing the events and beautiful illustrations that appear uh, around the world. Our goal here is through audiovisual synthesis to tell an immersive and encompassing story, breathing new life into the ancient myth and musical score. Um, all right. So for, for prototyping, early prototyping, it's really important to keep everything modular and non-destructive when you're creating an environment so that if you need to move things around and design the level, redesign, uh, it's flexible. And for me, Substance Designer is really useful in this regard for the texturing uh, of the world as it's entirely procedural. I can create a, like a dirt and a grass and we can blend them together with endless variations to enrich We're going to hand it off to Neil, who's going to talk a lot more about the animation pipeline. Uh, okay, I hope everyone can hear me. Hello, uh, I'm Neil. Uh, I want to talk to you today about how we capture performance for uh, Orpheus VR, this project. Uh, first, I want to tell you that there's two primary ways that we capture uh, motion capture these days. One is optical, where we use a series of cameras and reflective markers, which uh, bounce light off them and uh, we capture the data that way. And the other, which is a developing uh, form, is active tracking, where we use suits that have uh, motion sensors, which can then send data to a uh, computer. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, our process for this project was using an optical capture system to capture the body and the iPhone X um, with a plugin to capture the facial animation. Uh, typically, this process involves using, uh, uh, so a director will give you a shot list and then we will capture body motions and facial capture together, but in our case, separately. I'll go into that a little bit later. Uh, and the last two steps are cleaning up that uh, data, processing it, and then integrating it finally into the engine. So next, please. Uh, so this is a typical what a shot would look like from start to finish. You would get your uh, facial and body data, which you can see on the left, uh, and then you see the point cloud in the center, which is the raw data in form uh, which we get it in. And then we apply that to our 3D digital model. And finally, we integrate it into the game engine and add all the art and bells and whistles. So here you can see a little behind the scenes video. So how we did the body motion was uh, in that room that you saw there uh, using a 24 camera OptiTrack system. Uh, and uh, what we do is put markers on the actor's bodies uh, and that forms this green sort of point cloud that you can see, which is a direct representation of them. Uh, 
Uh, and then much like film production, we record, take off the tape. Um, next, please. And uh, our facial capture, we use uh, the iPhone X with uh, its forward facing depth camera. And we use Realusion and uh, they have a plugin called Lightface. It's part of their suite of plugins for motion capture. Uh, you can use this uh, either head mounted or you can use it fixed uh, in place later on. Uh, initially, we started off with it head mounted, but we found that it was quite heavy to have an iPhone strapped to someone's head for a long time. So we moved to fixed placement uh, and recorded all the takes separately. Uh, yeah, so finally, and uh, I think importantly, the this data that we collect uh, all needs to have uh, some editing done to it because uh, the computer will often introduce some glitches um, or uh, markers might be uh, moved out of place and so on. So the first step is cleaning all the data. Second, we solve it, which is just connecting it onto the characters, as I mentioned before. Uh, and uh, then we move on to motion editing, where uh, it's likely that we will need to stitch several pieces of motion capture animation uh, together or make them into loops, uh, which can be very easily uh, played in the game engine. And lastly, uh, also exaggerated in, in case the animation needs to be made more interesting than real life in certain aspects. Uh, and uh, finally, all of this goes into the game engine in our case, we use Unity, and we use a, a tool called the Timeline to sequence out the animations. Uh, and also, we use Unity's inbuilt Mech Anim system to trigger specific animations when we need them. All right, next slide. Yeah, so th thanks, and uh, feel free to ask me any questions later. All right, can everybody hear me? Hopefully. All right, we're, uh, we're running a bit short on time, so I'm going to be uh, quick. Um, so my name is Brian. I am the uh, composer and uh, sort of music director for VSVR. Uh, and the music is, is a very, very big subject. So mostly what I'm going to talk about today are just some of the, the considerations and challenges that we face. Um, so, you know, one thing that we've talked about this whole time, you know, is, is that in VR, the role of the audience actually can change and that you're no longer just this passive entity watching something uh, unfold in front of you, but you be can become something much more uh, engaged with it. You can interact with it. And our, our goal with this was that you as the, the user, as the audience, would be able to interact with the characters and shape the story, but also be able to shape the musical outcomes of things, this being a musically driven art form. Uh, now, one of the, the major challenges that comes up with this, uh, once you start adding interaction with the music, is the simple fact that music exists in time. Uh, what I mean by this is that music relies on structure and pacing, direction, carefully planned uh, tension and release. Any, any moment in a musical composition, the way that it has the impact that it does is largely because of everything that led to it. Now, once you start adding interaction, time becomes very flexible because musical layers or instruments, melodies, and ideas are now being dependent on a user doing something, and you can't guarantee when, where, or if they'll ever do that. So this is also being timed with or combined with very strictly timed performances and motion capture. So the place where we sort of started by conceptualizing the music was less about you know, how you might think of a traditional opera or musical form and more of, of what is the user doing or what are the possibilities for the user at any point because the musical material is going to have to adapt to, you know, is a section very free? Like, are we expecting a person to move through a space? Is it user directed in that the music is coming out of something they're doing or is in any moment this, this is a fixed, you know, now they're watching a part of a, a captured performance. Uh, next slide. And what this really meant for us is that the music is now intrinsically linked to the design of everything else because, you know, you have to sort of plot the performances in terms of, well, the person is starting in one area and they're going to make some type of decisions. And so we have to know what are all the possibilities musically for them entering any section, making decisions, leaving that section, moving to the next thing, how long will it take for them to do that? And even just going through the choice structure of, 
you know, in this section, the user can interact with five or six different objects. Well, what happens if they only interact with two or all of them or none of them, or they decide to just stop and, and wait there? There's a lot of design choices that have to come from what you are gonna allow the user to do, but also accounting for what anyone might do because it's entirely possible for someone to just kind of stop and smell the roses, so to speak. Hang on. And this is a, a very, very big topic, this idea of interactive or dynamic music, but essentially what we're talking about is this idea of the music is responding to something that the user is doing. And when you're developing anything interactive, really what you're looking for is usable data, some kind of information, some type of numbers or, or things that, that you can connect musical parameters to. And VR is, is very fruitful in that it's a digital world. So literally anything that you can imagine, we can use as data. So user actions, they can touch things, pick things up, interact with objects and characters. Um, but we can also use attributes of the characters. So their position or their location in the world, relationships to objects, you know, how far they are, are they between things, and even, even physics parameters such as how fast they're moving or, or where are they even looking. Um, and really the only limitation that we really found with this is that um, the more obscure the parameters that you're using, the less evident those interactions are to the user. So sometimes that can be very nice, um, but that's that's a, a huge element of it. And so what Debbie's brought up here, uh, even even a very so one of the one of the methods that we've been using quite a bit is dynamic layering, which is this idea that a given piece of music actually exists as a number of ind independent or interdependent layers. Uh, and as the user makes choices, the music actually evolves in the direction of their choice by adding, removing, remixing, or, or changing how all these different layers are sort of recombined to the user. And so this is, this is from the opening scene uh, where the user is sort of uh, shown their powers and said, okay, well, you have the ability to breathe life into the world or you have the ability to take life away. And the, the actual music that you hear is a mixture of uh, about nine different layers that allow you to, to hear Orpheus, to experience music, but to also have little UX things like they know when an interaction has happened. Um, but the music also evolves in the direction of their, their choices. So this is uh, why I'm not the artist for the little graph I drew. But essentially, the music, when you come into the world, starts this green layer, this very sort of simple string layer. We have Orpheus singing over top of it, which comes in. Uh, and then as you make choices, towards breathing in life, you add layers on top. As you decide to take life away, you add layers below, and they all sort of serve different functions for uh, the actual composition. And the stars here are actually that, one of the challenges that you run into with dynamic layering is that once you have a piece of music that's made up of about nine or more different layers, it can all of a sudden just turn into this massive wall of sound. And if you want the person to know that they're actually doing something or affecting the world, a lot of these layers aren't immediately like you touch something and a huge timpani roll comes in. They're, they're, they tend to be very sparse so that the gestalt of it is, is, is still you know, a reasonably constrained piece of music. But we also have these little musical flourishes that happen so the user knows, okay, I touch something, the music's gonna change a little bit, but it might not be immediately apparent. So we're just gonna show a little video, um, just a very accelerated version of that.
the end of our presentation. Thank you all so much. We've gone uh, over time, so we're supposed to wrap up at two, but if you do have any questions about, about any of the things that we're up to, please feel free to come to any of us and ask away. Um, the other thing is that part of our environment is that portal over there. Um, you're welcome to go down and pop in and check it out. Um, unfortunately, if you're on a standalone Oculus Quest that is not tethered to a computer, you will not be able to get in. But please, um, it will be open all throughout the whole conference, so you can have, um, it should be solved in a, in a couple of days. But thank you all so much. Thank you, PXR. Thank you to my amazing team for being here and sharing with us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. It's amazing to see all of you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Orpheus VR team. That was amazing. <laughs> that was great. Look, I have gestural mm. capabilities again. Uh, this is just a reminder that at 2.15, we will have Yelena Vachitsky from Oculus Experience here to talk with us today. And that will be in PXR Central, so the place that you automatically spawn to most of the time. Be sure to take a break. I know we've been going through a lot today. And hopefully we'll see all of you in PXR Central at 2.15. Thanks so much.
we're going to get started. We're going to get started. Thank oh. you for your patience. Finish your conversations, but we're, we're going to get started, and you have all of 10 seconds. So please feel free to wrap up. We're not monsters here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, and there we go. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your, um, thank you for your patience. It's um, it's wonderful to have you here in the final event of uh, of today, our keynote. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the support of the Canada Council to the Digital Strategies Fund. Without their support, none of this would be possible. And I'd also like to acknowledge where I am. I am. I'm in Kingston, which is the traditional land of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples. And I'm I'm honored to uh, be conducting this beautiful journey on the lands that is are traditionally theirs. Um, we've talked a little bit about mechanics as far as the raising your hand participation because feedback is very important. So thank you all for jumping on uh, on board there. And another reminder for those of you on the live stream, uh, please post in the Discord and we will uh, try to get to your questions time time allow. So without further ado, uh, please let me introduce Alex Doe. Alex Doe is a uh, theater creator, um, director, and actor. Um, he's the associate artistic director of Single Thread. He is also the former artistic director of Theatre by the Bay, and he's also the project lead for this um, wonderful conference that we're all participating in. So please give him a warm clicky click, 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 click. Yes, very good. And also um, a fact that I, I need to say, he actually made this space that we're all in. So please give him a warm hand. Alex, please take it away. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. That, that's very kind of you. Um, but uh, I have the, uh, uh, the real honor right now of introducing to you a really, really special guest that we have with us, uh, Yelena Rachitsky. Yelena is the executive producer of Experiences at Oculus. Uh, she has overseen dozens of groundbreaking uh, narrative-driven VR projects that range from Pixar's first VR project um, to a whole bunch of others, and we're going to hear about those uh, today. And before she was at Oculus, uh, Yelena was creative producer uh, for the future of storytelling, which aims to change how people communicate and tell stories in the digital age. Uh, she has also helped program for the Sundance Film Festival and the Institute's New Frontier program. Uh, she spent four years in the uh, documentary division at Participant Media and has worked on films like Food, Inc. and Waiting for Superman. Uh, Yelena is passionate about big creative ideas that are going to make uh, this technology and all technology uh, meaningful. And uh, let's give her a, a big round of applause because this is awesome that she's come. She is here from uh, speaking to us from Los Angeles today. <laughs> Elena, welcome Great. to PXR. Thank you so much for having me. Um, speaking at these are so much easier now that I don't have to travel and have jet lag, although up in Vancouver is the, is, is the same time zone. Um, but I'm really, really happy to have he to be here, and I'm really, really impressed with what you were able to do with this virtual space. So it exceeded my expectations. Oh, excellent. Um, yeah, maybe this is the future of, of all conferences, Yelena. We don't have to get on an airplane <laughs> every single time. Uh, yes. Um, so uh, maybe we should begin by, um, we'd love to hear your story. And, and how did you make this journey from documentary filmmaker to, to VR producer? Yeah. Uh, so let's see. I grew up in Los Angeles and I was a creative in Los Angeles. And so generally when you're a creative in Los Angeles, you go towards the entertainment industry because that's the place where you can get a job while also trying to be creative. Um, and I first started out in the independent film and documentary world because I really thought, how do we create change? How do we use creativity? How do I satisfy my insatiable curiosity? And all of that, um, which is really exciting. And I, you know, it was very powerful to be able to be part of films like Food, Inc., where you can actually see how it changed people's emotional um, stance on topics and how they were emotionally affected. And to be able to experience that for something that um, helped come to life uh, was really powerful. But what I also started to see was um, it just felt kind of like a the same cycle over and over again. People make a film, 
Uh, people sit in the audience, they watch it, they're emotionally affected, uh, but there really isn't that uh, participation, which is funny because I was working at a place called Participant Media. Um, and at that time, uh, about over a decade ago or so, I was at a participant for about four years, I started seeing really interesting things starting to pop up with um, how people were using technology to tell stories in different ways. And actually, one of my big inspirations was the National Film Board of Canada and the raw experimentation of the future of storytelling with um, interactive projects like Welcome to Pine Point and uh, Bear 71 uh, and both things happening on the, uh, the Vancouver side of NFB Interactive and on the Quebec side of NFB Interactive. Um, so that was really exciting, starting to see that pop up. Um, introduced to Sundance New Frontier before I started working there. Uh, and then I also went to Burning Man for the first year that, you know, over a decade ago, where I started to see, like, the possibility of what participatory culture could be and true interactivity, um, how engaged people felt when they felt like they were more part of a something versus just an observer. And that really started my investigation into what that meant, into what that meant for me. Um, and I remember when I left my job at Participant, uh, I really didn't know what I was gonna do. I just knew that there was like a spark of something to explore, that technology and creativity um, had things to discover that could potentially be really impactful, truly participatory, and, and really engaging. So off I set. <laughs> My parents were not happy that I just quit a job without having something to move out to. Um, but I had to trust that gut. Um, and then through that, that took me to uh, Sundance New Frontier, uh, which is a really exciting time when I was there because things were just starting to kind of uh, come, up, come up. And uh, it was still very, I, I felt like a lot of the artists were still very isolated in the things that they were doing. Um, there was people doing really incredible like projection mapping, hacking connect sensors, which incorporated your body, uh, where you can like move your body and felt like it was part of the projection. Uh, people were doing interesting stuff on the web, um, web documentaries or some interactive storytelling, especially a lot of the stuff that I was seeing from NFB and also Arte in France. Um, uh, but it was all kind of like isolated and in different parts of the world. And, and our job was to help bring that together help inform audiences of what might be happening. Um, so that was that that was fun. Uh, and I love I love being on that space of just discovery. I think that's what really gets me excited and also following curiosity. Then um, the uh, there was the Kickstarter campaign for uh, for the, the Oculus Rift which popped up. And I remember as at Sundance, I was like, oh, it says that it's gaming, but there's something kind of interesting here. It feels like something that's in this one device that doesn't have to be location specific and feels truly immersive. Like, is there a use case for this beyond gaming potentially? So uh, I went with another a person from Sundance down to like their very, one of their very first Irvine offices. And I remember I tried, um, I think it was called VR cinema, where you're sitting in a virtual movie theater, basically watching a short film, a movie. And then some game, I think it was Eve Valkyrie or you know, something where you're like in space and shooting things, very gamey. And even the part of sitting in a movie theater, uh, the embodied aspect of me feeling like I was present in a space, even though there was nothing really truly innovative about sitting in a movie theater watching a movie, but there was a spark of, there was something there that was unique. So we brought it to Sundance that year. Um, I forgot, that was maybe six or seven years ago. Uh, and before then, I found that New Frontier was just this really cool space that you love to go to, but it was always like the weird kids in the corner. And then the year that we brought VR there, it was a bit of an explosion. I think it was the first time that a lot of the traditional storytellers and filmmakers tried a technology and recognized like, oh, there's something here for me too. It's not just, you know, a projection art on the wall or something that's like installation art. Like there's actually something that I think my narrative skills can take me there because I feel so present in the space and it affects me in a more embodied visceral way versus um, versus just uh, vicariously living through a narrative, which is still very, very powerful. 
Um, so then from there, m that journey took me to future of storytelling. Uh, so I moved over to New York. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Future of Storytelling Summit, but it, it was also another really awesome job. Uh, it's a summit that happens every year that thinks about how are we, how is the digital age change, changing the way we tell stories, um, but also bringing thinkers from all around the world uh, to discuss and understand what's happening. So the psychology of storytelling, the technology of storytelling, um, and so forth. And so. That gave me kind of a greater understanding of where things can go. Um, but, you know, I think since that first spark of putting on a headset and knowing that, like, I think this is the thing we were looking for, because you don't have to be in a specific location and almost any kind of art or creation can fit into the space and an audience from anywhere in the world can actually experience that. Uh, just kept tugging at me. So from there, I moved over to Oculus Story Studio. Um, that was about almost five years ago. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Oculus Story Studio, but uh, it was uh, founded with the question of, can you tell a story inside of VR? Because uh, at that time, that wasn't something that we knew because you're present in a space, but you don't have all of the techniques that you have for uh, for storytelling, you don't have uh, the cuts, you don't have the close-ups, uh, you know, it's, uh, what is that new language that we're kind of creating? Um, and from there started that in investigation, which has been really, really exciting. Uh, and I think through there, and, and also just going back a little bit in, um, when I was living in New York for Future of Storytelling, one of the things that I really got excited about and that gave me that real sparkly eye effect was my deep dive into immersive theater within the New York scene. And that to me was also a drive within VR because the feeling that I got from immersive theater of being embodied in a space and feeling like I'm part of the show and an actor just taking me on this like whimsical journey and creating uh, these moments of presence and making me feel like I was there was so powerful. I was like, how can technology replicate that in any way? Can technology help uh, at least give some feeling of that, that strong human feeling that immersive theater gave me? Especially, um, I think Then She Fell was one of my big inspirations because it was just, it was so intimate and it was so wonderful. So when I was at Future of Storytelling, I don't know, then when I was at Oculus Story Studio, we thought a lot about that as well in telling the story because in immersive theater space, they really think about uh, how do you guide bodies through spaces? How do you tell physical stories? How do you use space and the movement through space to guide? How do you use lighting and sound uh, to help guide? Because uh, that's really, the power, how do you find that balance between um, uh, creating a space and a world for exploration, but creating a world and guiding your audience or your participant or whatever we decide to call it uh, on the journey that you've created for them. And so it's that constant give and take that I think immersive theater has been like crafting so, so beautifully. Um, so we actually worked with uh, Third Rail who made Then She Fell uh, on one of the VR projects, Wolves in the Walls, which ended up winning an Emmy last year, to really learn of how do you craft your connection with character, connection to space, um, uh, using the techniques that have been learned throughout. Uh, so that's a long-winded answer of kind of how I came to the VR space, and then we can chat a little bit of, about what's happened since then. <laughs> I, I think to say that was long-winded does it a, a great disservice, Elena, because that was a great answer, and it, it was so <laughs> it's so cool to hear how you've had like a front row seat to this really incredible moment for VR, um, and and uh, how, how your career has has developed alongside that. Um, I want to kind of zero in on on something you were talking about that when you you know the first time you you tried VR that it was like a game, and if you could speak to I don't know in terms of what people are expecting when they, they put on a VR headset or um, how is how is VR not just a platform for games? How is it a platform for, for storytelling? And how do you communicate that to people? Yeah, I think, um, I think games have been a very obvious fit because in the past games 
are basically created in a 3D, three-dimensional world. You just experience it on a flat screen. But the models are 3D. You're going through various worlds. It's really just that transference of bringing it into VR. It's definitely not the same. And it's very hard for game developers to transfer their skills over into VR. But it's an obvious jump. All the other things that we're bringing into VR, we're kind of reinventing, uh, not from scratch, but really, really a much bigger reinvention than it has been for games. Um, so I think there, the question's in two parts. There's the um, creative aspect of how do you make content, uh, non-gaming content for, for VR. I think VR has a incredible potential to be for everything. Like right now we are at a conference. Uh, we could easily jump into uh, doing like what we're calling infinite office of, uh, or a virtual desktop of creating work and doing something that's productive. Or we can go and uh, watch a story or watch a movie. The idea of a virtual world is that it's, in a sense, can recreate reality, but in a virtual space. So it, it, the possibilities are limitless. I think the um, the slight gap that we're going to be taking a little time to, to work through is who the, currently the audience is, because realistically, the people that have been buying headsets early on were generally early tech adopters, and usually those are people who uh, love games and love new technology. So it's important for us to have um, the things that we know that the audience that are actually purchasing the headsets want, but at the same time, working and experimenting and pushing the stuff forward that we think will be here um, within the future. The best way of showcasing to people or convincing people that VR is more than just games is putting a headset on and having them try things. Uh, VR is such a show, don't tell type of medium that it's always, and I think that's been one of the most challenging things of how do you convey the magic that VR has through a commercial or through uh, like a 2D ad. Um, the real power is when you actually put on the headset and someone feels physically embodied in a world and so many things are opened up to them. Um, we have travel apps, we have storytelling apps, we have uh, education apps, uh, you know, there's just so much that's there, but it's really just getting the headset and having someone try it so they can see it for themselves. Um, I think another thing that's been interesting, especially for me, uh, because I have been kind of working a little bit more in the experimental space than the mainstream space of trying to discover uh, what storytelling is. Um, uh, even, you know, I, I, I helped launch a piece this past year called The Tempest and The Ender Presents with the Tender Claws team. Uh, I don't know if you guys had a chance to try it, uh, but it's been one of my passion projects <laughs> for, the, for the past year. And I've been loving working with, with Tender Claws to bring something that to life. And I feel very fortunate that the company's been giving me resources to be in that explorative space. Um, but it's all kind of new. So we have to balance out. Uh, understanding that the audience is looking for stuff, especially if they're paying for it, at a certain quality level. And it's very hard for a lot of things that are coming out that are uh, outside that, that are experimental, um, to be uh, uh, presentable enough for a general audience. You know, the things that we have to deal with is like frame rate and motion sickness and so forth. Uh, so all the stuff that we're working on outside of gaming as well, we're slowly getting there to that space that is high quality enough that the mainstream audience versus the niche audience starts um, really acclimating and getting connected to. Um, thank you. Again, a, an amazing answer. Um, I, uh, one of the things that uh, inspired me to organize the conference in this way was that um, when the pandemic started, uh, I was kind of stuck inside and I, I convinced my two friends to get a VR headset, and uh, we were throwing frisbee around in uh, in rec room, and just that They're feeling of, of tossing the frisbee back and forth made me go, "Wow!" Like I feel like everyone would benefit from this this type of uh, this type of technology. And something that I I was really curious about was what was it like for you at uh, at Oculus when the pandemic started? Did you see like increased interest for this technology when when that happened 
Um, what was going on behind the scenes? If you, if you could, uh, you know, let us, let us into the smoke filled room. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, you know, I think it would have been perfect if <laughs> definitely not perfect. We don't want the pandemic to hit at all. Two years from now, it would have been awesome for the pandemic to hit for VR because a lot of the things that people are really would need, like social collaboration and connection, would be a much higher quality and much more useful than it is now because this is the stuff we're just building right now. Um, but with that said, the headsets were sold out consistently during the pandemic. Um, and usage was definitely much higher for for obvious reasons. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have all the things that people needed. Like, you know, VR, we're getting there, but VR isn't yet going to be more productive than your computer or your phone necessarily. But, you know, there's a bunch of games that, you know, again, people who love games can go into. But the thing that I felt to be really magical was um, like, for instance, my brother lives in San Francisco and I haven't seen him since before the pandemic because they're, you know, really hunkering down. And uh, we went into Oculus venues and watched the, um, the SpaceX NASA launch together and watched the countdown with like a hundred other people cheering. And he was, sitting right next to me um, and it felt like we were actually hanging out and having a moment in a much more embodied way and in a much more connected way than we've been able to have um, through our phone calls or through our video chats, which has been really powerful. Uh, then, you know, it's been fun going in like venues. We've also had live webcams from like the Monterey Aquarium, for instance. And I remember when I went in there, there was a uh, a bunch of teenagers who are homeschooled right now, and they were um, feeling like they were on a field trip, which is pretty exciting. So mm -hmm. you can imagine people, kids or teenagers stuck in their rooms, uh, really not seeing that many people and then being able to virtually travel, feel like they're at the Monterey Aquarium and actually connect and talk to other people. Uh, the other thing is like live events, of course. I mean, the push that we've been seeing of the creativity rise. And I, I do think oftentimes constraints do breed creativity. So it's not only like Oculus that's been pushing, pushing hard on social features, on making it uh, all the things that we really, really want VR to be. It's also been incredible watching the community come together and figure stuff out, just like you're doing with this conference. Um, <laughs> I'm sure this is not what you planned last year, but that you're able to create this awesome space and have this community here. I mean, I probably wouldn't have been able to travel to Canada at this time, but I get to be here and I get to connect with your community and I get to connect with you. And so I think it's started to um, break some barriers that were there before. Um, same thing with the Burning Man Alt Space event that we were just talking about before. Uh, I think my Burning Man community, uh, they, never talk about VR with me. They are just to love analog, love being out um, in the space, love like tangible things. Uh, but to see the community just kind of come together and make incredible digital sculptures and this expansive space um, and find creative solutions to bringing people together virtually, uh, I think has just been so mind blowing how quickly things are happening in such a short period of time and i would encourage everyone to check out the burning man space like you can see the the, the environment in alt space and it's really really neat um, yeah yelena we have a lot of uh people here who are creators themselves in 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 particularly in the field of performance uh directors uh writers uh, yeah, I usually just say theater creators. What advice would you have for them as they kind of embark on creating content uh, in virtual reality? There's definitely a gap, right? Uh, in terms of like technical knowledge, what can they do? What advice do you have for them? Yeah, um, I'm seeing a lot of really, really interesting stuff pop up and I'm, you know, specifically I'm thinking about the immersive theater space that's happening within VR. Um, so for instance, with Tender Claws and uh, The Ender Presents the Tempest, uh, the Tender Claws team is 
you know, they're digital developers, um, the two partners. Danny is a technical genius. Sam is an amazing storyteller, but they partnered with Pi Hole uh, out of New York, which is an experimental theater group. And so they combined both of those talents of understanding how do you create story for a digital medium with actual experimental actors to come together and really create something truly magical. Um, and it, it was just so inspiring to watch it come to life and to be able to see actors start using the tools, like immersive theater actors who weren't very familiar with technology. They now were, have been spending like 20, 30 hours in headset creating intimate performances and magical experiences for people um, and learning how to use those tools. Uh, the actors didn't have to develop, but the build that Tender Claws created for the actors allows them to have like godlike features, allows them to their journey, and they've actually started even creating their created followings by fans who have loved uh, individual actors and have been following them on, <laughs> on Instagram. And so it's really fascinating to see this new kind of like actor and performance and fan base um, start coming to life through this. Um, apart from that, like VR can definitely be intimidating, especially to create something good. And within the limitations of the technology is really hard. And that's not, you know, that's not something to s s skim around. It's just a really hard thing to to do well. And a lot there's very like there's starting to be more developers making good stuff, but it's been taking we've we've been in this for what five years now, and we're starting to just see like awesome work get made because um, everything's been figured out before. So um, with that, uh, some of the notable other things that I've been witnessing is like the incredible stuff that's been popping out from, for instance, VR chat. Um, there was a project in Venice VR by Kira Benzik and her team. I'm forgetting what the exact name of the play was, but, uh, but they won a prize at the Venice VR Festival through their immersive theater show created within VR chat. So it's partnering with your, you know, if you have no technical knowledge, it's finding the person who knows how to make stuff and, and co-developing it together. Because I think there's a lot of technical people that are really interested in making something unique and creative. Um, same thing for uh, something called Neos VR, which is another metaverse world. And there was another project made from there called uh, Metamovie, I believe. And that's also another interactive experience. And they used a lot of the tools uh, that and the creator tools that Neos made um, to be able to make this show. Uh, the other thing is Horizon, which I know is still in its beta build. Um, and I just spent a few minutes in there again uh, before I came in here. But once that starts bec becoming more accessible, the creator tools in there are much easier than coding. Definitely more limited than what you can do with Unity and create spaces like this. But I can see that really, really growing. And then I can see that starting to be a space for more performances to start taking shape. Um, so you find the partner who helps build the world if it's not something you're comfortable with. It's not that dissimilar from, you know, if you're a director, you have to find the camera person that knows all the technical stuff of how to shoot. Or if you're a theater maker, you have to find your lighting technician and uh, a person who knows all like the, the technical stuff across the stage and the music. So it's just a new type of technical partner that you would have to work with to really create. Um, the best thing you can always do in VR to really know how to make something is just try as much stuff as possible. Um, it's really, really hard to think like, oh, this would be really cool in VR. Because once you're in it, it's just generally about how something feels to you and why something works and why something doesn't work. Like, when do you find connection with uh, a character? How do you create something social where people can um, understand what's going on and uh, be uh, have positive behavior with each other? Uh, when did you get moved by like some set design that happened? What didn't work for you? And through that of really trying and experimenting and not just theater stuff, like we have so much to learn from the interactivity within games, um, all the different social spaces that are out there. It's just learning to you because I think everyone's theater work is personal to them, of what their story is, of what they're trying to create with the audience, really understanding why does something work for you? Why doesn't it work for you? Start taking shape from there and then find your technical partners to help start making it happen in some way. Yelena, we started a bit late, so I was wondering if it was all right with you and with our attendees if we extended by 10 minutes, if we just went an extra yeah, yeah. 10. 
Is that okay? Yep, as long as my Wi-Fi holds. Do you still hear me okay? And I was having sound issues before. I, I hear you so clearly. Actually, Perfect. I, it's, I'm it's funny. It's, it's night and day from before. I don't think I've ever heard someone <laughs> speak so clearly in VR. This is yeah. great. We were cutting uh, it close before, but <laughs> my audio wasn't working at all. So I'm really happy it worked out. So, and I was I was told while uh, while you were speaking there that the, the title of that piece from Venice is uh, "Finding Pandora X." Uh, yes. You were thank you. Thank you. Um, so, on that note, since I'm getting oh, I got someone making a sad face. Okay, all right. Uh, on that note, <laughs> definitely, and that <laughs> note too, I think let's open it up to the uh, to the the crowd for for questions. And this is a brand new feature that we were figuring out this morning. <laughs> so let's see how we do. Liam Liam is going to manage uh, our questions. And uh, let's let's see how we do here, okay? In the spirit of experimentation. All right, we uh, we have a question from uh, Michael Wheeler. Michael Wheeler, you're uh, live in VR. Hey, Michael. Oh, I can't hear you. Hear me. Oh yeah, you there you go. Now? Yeah, yep. great. I like your, I like your mohawk. Um, Oh, thank you so much. It's a bit aspirational, but it's, it's serving me well here. Um, thank you. It was really awesome to hear everything you had to say. And um, uh, when I did Tempest, I'm, you know, I'm mostly a theater person who's kind of arriving in VR this year, I guess. Uh, it, I found it like a really fundamental shift in terms of what I understood could could be possible in a theatrical context. And um, I'm just curious, I know the main performer, I felt like they were more photorealistic than the avatars that we're here wearing. And I'm just wondering like, what the difference is in how performers in that piece are captured as opposed to audience. Wait, so the question is the performers in uh, Tempest versus the audience in Tempest? Yes, uh, my experience was that the performer in that piece was more, I would call photorealistic. Uh -huh. And I'm just wondering if they're captured in a different way or if they're just also oh. using a quest or... Yeah, honestly, so so they're just an avatar just like um, we are right now. All the actors are wearing are just quests and controllers. And mm -hmm. um, through uh, IK, they're able to predict like where the feet are moving and so forth. So there's definitely some limitations. Um, but it's interesting that you say that because actually I find the avatars to be highly, highly stylized where you don't see their mouths moving. Uh, you don't really see any facial expressions uh, versus here you see start seeing um, uh, mouth moving and like the eyes, even though the eyes here kind of drift a little bit, <laughs> um, you don't see that. So the perf the audiences in the tempest you know it takes a bit of a playbook from something like sleep no more where everyone's a bit anonymous and you wear the mask and so everyone kind of looks the same but made in exactly the same way they're made in unity they're just styled very differently uh, but i think what's interesting there is because the actors are so expressive i think your imagination um, fills in the gaps to make it feel more realistic to you uh, and I think that's one of the the things to think about for VR. We're not there yet where we can have fully realistic uh, avatars that uh, exactly see what your facial expressions are or where you're looking or how you smile. And as humans, we are so registered to read facial expressions. So I actually find uh, when you try to put too much face uh, and you don't get the exact reads, that starts getting into an uncanny valley zone. Uh, but if you leave a you know bit of a, a gap and keep it stylized uh, somewhat, then audiences start filling in the gaps with their imagination based on what they're hearing and gesturing and the gestures you hear from, from the actors. So it's interesting that you say photorealistic because to me they're just highly, highly um, stylized, but made it, made it exactly the same way. Cool. Thanks for that answer. And I would just add that my, my performer was extremely talented and a very good <laughs> improviser. And, and that was for me part of it why it worked as well. Like I can't imagine like a subpar performer pulling that role off. I think. Yeah, no, I've been I've been impressed. I tried so the the team gave me the actor build. And I remember I tried to go into the under presents once as an actor because so and, and what's really funny is as an actor, they have um, uh, a virtual dressing room, which you first start in. And when you go into the virtual dressing room, you can pick what avatar you look like and 
where you want to spawn from and you know how tall you want to be uh and things like that and so i did and i went into the ender i was like gonna do like a little one-on-one -on -one, and i got super intimidated i was like someone please like me do you want me to do a magic <laughs> trick for you <laughs> that's amazing um <laughs> so the ability for these immersive theater actors to translate their skills into VR um, so quickly and to be, and still create such a magical time of performance, even though you can't hear the audience, is a testament to just how they are. And, you know, what people have said is that every time they've gone to a different performance of The Tempest, it's always been slightly different. So even though there's slight script, the improvisation they're able to do um is 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 pretty incredible and a lot of them kind of have taken on and expanded their characters and to um built them up in ways so they've kind of taken it into their own hands and created a life of their own with their characters beyond their initial beyond their initial um uh beyond their initial role which has been super fun on that uh we actually I, i've been told by someone in the audience that we have one of the actors from the under here <gasps> the wow and uh, that uh, maybe maybe Deirdre will join us at Pennafather's Tavern after him. We can ask uh, questions uh, about The Under, which you, everyone should download. You can download it on your quest. The Under presents, and then you can get a ticket to see The Tempest. Very well worth your time. It's oh, a actually, piece. sadly. Oh, oh, no. oh sorry, end? guys. Yeah, the, the this run just ended September 30th. Oh. oh. Um, but the under presents the main experience uh, has actors in there. You just never know if you'll get an actor experience uh, until the end of the year. But the Tempest itself, uh, we might, you know, bring it back. We have to see. But this first run finished. That's, so that's our loss if we missed out. And uh, <laughs> Liam, do we have uh, do we have time for uh, another question? Uh, we definitely do. And just if I may, uh, everyone, uh, just a reminder. The emoji, um, the button to hit if you'd like to ask a question isn't the hand in the normal emoji menu. It's in the bottom right corner, just to clarify that. Just a reminder. Um, we've actually got a question um, from the uh, Discord from someone that's um, live streaming uh, right now. Um, but, and we're going to go to that question. But before we do, Jenny Erb has a question for us. Uh, Jenny, could you give us a wave? You should have just. Hey, sorry. Um, I think that's a mistake. I was just using the raise hand back before the no, presentation perfect. started. When you oh, no, no. How to use it. Oh, oh, no problem. Thank you for uh, <laughs> sending me about this. Is, you know, I, I, I will, uh, I'm thankfully sorry. So let's pretend this never happened. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, really it's, funny. Not, it's all not real. And let's go to our, on, uh, let's go to Aiden, who has a question from the Discord. Great. Hello, all. Uh, our question from the Discord is, Oculus is a company. You mentioned the role of guiding people. How do you plan to guide for social cohesion and diversity in VR? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, a big part of, and so much of our conversations, especially in the social VR space right now, is how do you make people, people feel comfortable? Um, given that, you know, VR isn't quite real life, there is sometimes some level of anonymity um, and the internet, although started off as a utopian vision, has a lot of <laughs> dark spaces. So, so much of the tools that we think about um, and that the, the, the social teams really think about is how do you create a sense of safety? How do you make everyone feel welcome um, how do you make sure people have the tools to report other people uh, if they make them uncomfortable um, there is even uh, we have um, live moderators making sure that the spaces have uh, no abuse in them and everyone is completely completely comfortable definitely a hard problem to solve but it's something that is thought about 
And I think that goes into all parts of the experience, even like the design of an experience, I think shifts people's behavior. So like Horizon, I think the avatars are friendly and the space is also a lot brighter. Um, I gave it a talk at Oculus Connect a couple of years ago called The Hierarchy of Being Embodying Your Virtual Self. And in it, uh, me and my colleague, Isabel, who I gave the talk with, we talk about how even when you embody an avatar, it actually shifts the way that you behave. Um, the objects that you pick up shift the way that you behave. The space that you're in shifts the way that you behave. So it's a combination of both design tools um, uh, and the ability for all of the users to be able to protect themselves in some way. In addition, just the conversation of diversity is one that's close to my heart and something we talk a lot about. Uh, in order for VR to be successful, it has to cater and be there for a broad range of people um, or else it's just never going to get big. So it has to be a space that's welcoming for people, but also created by a diverse group of people. Um, and, you know, it's hard. I think people generally go to what they're most comfortable with, developers that are very high quality. Uh, but we have a bunch of different programs. Um, one of them is called Launchpad VR. And that's a program where every year there's about 100 or so uh, people that we bring um, to ensure that we're supporting diverse creators and diverse developers. Uh, this year they added a section for Horizon World Building, for instance, um, but also including games and also including storytelling. I know on my team, one thing we really look at and we're really trying to figure out the best way to do it is how do we ensure the people that we support and fund are a diverse range of people and keeping an eye on that. Um, so I'm not saying that we've solved everything in any way and we have a long way to go, but I know for my team and for many teams, it's a really top of mind. Um, yeah, and I've certainly seen that in the, uh, the VR for good um, projects that you've undertaken. That's been really cool, uh, some of that stuff and building uh, empathy and, and uh, allowing people to jump inside particular types of experience. That's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we have time for uh, one more question. Liam, do you wanna connect us to yeah. that? Yes, we have, uh, Jason has a question. Jason, you're uh, live. Thank you. Uh, I'm really enjoying everything that I'm hearing today. Uh, I wanted to ask about, this may be my filmmaker background, but with your, with your, theater shows that you've been doing, immersive theaters in VR, uh, have, has there been thought put towards archiving and recording like a particular performance so that it can live on when, mm -hmm. you know, say the ad actor isn't there or whatever? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, I haven't, but for instance, with the Tempest and the Edda Presents, uh, Samantha Gorman, who's the co-founder of Tender Claws, she just got her PhD in the in, in digital storytelling, basically. She, so she was going in and capturing um, different things uh, as part of her dissertation. So hopefully she's got a lot of that um, saved. Uh, something I do think we need better tools for is in headset capture that's, that's higher quality. I don't think our uh, ability to record from in VR with our experiences is a super great experience and generally doesn't look great <laughs> when we post it online. We think we have this amazing magical experience and we post it online and we're like, look how cool this was. And all people see that don't have VR is like weird, jangly looking <laughs> Where are your arms? characters. You don't have arms. Like, <laughs> we're like, yeah. but no, it was magic, I promise. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, I I haven't been. I think that's a great uh, a great thing to think about, especially with things moving so quickly, and thinking about um, thinking about uh, the pivotal things that have shifted the course of uh, the, the direction of a lot of these art forms. Sometimes you don't know that something's pivotal until it's like ten years later, and you remember the thing, and you're like, give me find me video footage so we could use that in our classes. Um, but it's a good question. It's something that I'll take into consideration um, as, we're, as we're making more stuff. But specifically with the under, I think Samantha might, might have some stuff. I'll, I'll check in with her. Amazing. Um, Yelena, we're at time. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to, to come here and be with us. I, I, it's been so great to, to listen to all your thoughts.
thoughts on this? And uh, I really, I, this was Yelena's idea to do this sort of format as a QA, and and I think that worked super well. Yeah. The, the, oh, I'm taking a picture. Take there picture, we go. Yeah. Cool. Take your picture. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I just took a picture of everyone. Um, thank you so much. I No, this is a favorite topic of mine. Um, I feel like all these different things are starting to, to pop up around the theater space. And I, I do think, like I mentioned with COVID, it forces a different kind of creativity. And um, really, I've just been more of the kind of supporter of it, but it's the magic that all of you guys make in your community that makes is what's going to continue pushing this and making all of this better. Um, so thank you for just doing continuing the art forms and making awesome stuff and um, having conversations about it. And uh, this was really fun to be to be part of. We appreciate you saying that it's definitely a tough time for like for the live space right now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, Ian, do you want to? I could imagine. Maybe get us and, and conclude our day. Yes. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks for um, another uh, round of emojis for Alex and Elena, if you wouldn't mind. I think they deserve it. That was what it's such oh, a generous thank sharing. You. Yeah, it's so good to have uh, have you here. And uh, thank thank you to all of you for uh, joining us in this grand experiment and building building this together. Um, over the next uh, afterwards, I think we are going to go to Penny Father. So if you have time, please feel free to uh, come to the tavern with us. Also, during the next uh, week, the Discord will be live. Um, I don't know if uh, if this has been universally spread, but there are uh, Easter eggs and hidden worlds all over the space, and it will be open. So I would encourage you. We would encourage you to check those spaces out. It's it's a lot of fun. Also, we have some, as you probably have realized, amazing individuals here exploring this with us this week. Um, uh, and some of them have built some amazing worlds. Um, Two-Spirited Trickster, Raven, sorry, I'm just going to call you out right now, I have shared with Jenna's enough to share something that she built um, in the Discord. Um, I would encourage you to check that out. I would encourage you to build and share in the Discord. Let's keep that active. And uh, thank you so much for a great weekend. We, uh, the PXR 2020 team, we're so proud of this, and we're so proud to be exploring this with you. So thank you very much. Please stay in touch. And we'll see you on Discord um, until we see you in Alt Space next week. Thanks so much, everyone. Be well. Explore. Explore. Mm -hmm.